The following is a keynote speaker presentation from the ACM 97 conference, the next 50 years of computing. ACM 97 brought together over 2,000 leaders and luminaries from all aspects of the computing world to discuss and predict what the next 50 years of computing has in store. ACM 97 underwriters were Computer World, Hewlett Packard, Intel, Microsoft, and Sun Microsystems. Sponsors were Cadmus Journal Services, IBM, Netscape, Popular Science, Sheridan Printing Company Incorporated, Silicon Graphics Incorporated, SoftBank, and Unisys. The event also included a major exposition with a paleotechnic look back to the future from the year 2047, and a specially commissioned book, Beyond Calculation, featuring essays on the next 50 years of computing by luminaries and pioneers in the field. The ACM 97 conference was chaired by Robert Metcalf and emceed by James Burke. Details on how to obtain more information on ACM 97 follow this program. Ladies and gentlemen, James Burke. By any standards in any field, this man is an outstanding world scholar and scientist, and I think we're privileged to have him come here and talk to us. He began with a PhD from MIT, like all good and serious people, in 1951, in the same year he was already a member of the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. The following year, he was teaching at the University of Chicago. In 55, he moved to Caltech, where he is, at present, emeritus in theoretical physics. In recognition of his unparalleled achievements in one of the fundamentally important fields of science, he has received honorary degrees from very, very many institutions, including Yale, Cambridge, Columbia, Chicago, and even Oxford. He's a director of the MacArthur Foundation, a foreign member of the Royal Society, former citizen regent of the Smithsonian, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and a former member of the President's Committee of Advisors on Science and Technology. He's also that rarest of breeds, a theoretical physicist whose interests are so wide-ranging, including, to name just a few, national, natural history, archaeology, cultural evolution, historical linguistics, psychology, cognition, population studies, ecology, economic sustainability, and geopolitics, that he is as much a philosopher as he is a scientist. At present, his research center at the Santa Fe Institute, the home of interdisciplinary studies, has been focusing on, among other things, complex adaptive systems, a matter that brings together virtually every subject of human intellectual endeavor. What gives his work, and what it is he'll be saying here today, such extraordinary power, is that he has, in one sense, gone beyond the limitations of reductionism to a large, comprehensive overview of our condition. When he talks about computers and what they'll do to us and for us over the next 50 years, his canvas is broad. And the really great, you used to say neat, didn't you? The really neat thing about all this is that his Nobel Prize was for his work right at the other end of the scale, so to speak, in fundamental particles, for his discovery of what he named quarks and his development of the quantum field theory, now known as quantum chromodynamics. It gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce Murray Gell-Mann. Thank you very much, James, for that wonderful introduction. I'm not sure, though, that I really ought to thank you, because the chances of living up to it are zero. <laughs> but I'll try to say a few things that are useful if I can. It's a pleasure as well as an honor to give this last talk at ACM before the summing up. It's also a challenge, though, because so many brilliant and talented speakers 
the ones who have preceded me have made most of the points that need to be made. I hope, though, that some of what I have to say is not just a duplication of previous material, because I'd like to concentrate on a set of issues generally receiving less attention than many others. We here, in this dawn of the so-called information age, a great deal of talk about the explosion of information, new methods for its dissemination. The digital revolution is gathering momentum with new technologies and their applications racing ahead, and you are, by and large, the people who are doing it. At least as important as the technical and commercial developments themselves are, as numerous participants have emphasized, the alterations that will take place in our thought patterns and in our institutions, determining how we respond to those developments and make use of them. And ACM 97, fortunately, has offered a wealth of insights into these matters. It's important to realize, however, that much of what is disseminated is misinformation, badly organized information, or irrelevant information. My question is, how can humanity extract from that welter of confusing bits knowledge and understanding and even a modicum of wisdom? How can we establish a reward system such that many competing but skillful processors of information acting as intermediaries will arise to interpret for us this mass of unorganized, partially false material? We can easily see that the reward system today is not appropriate. For example, in academic work and in some other walks of life, the principal incentives are for adding little bits of knowledge or understanding at the frontier of science or scholarship. In my field of physics, for example, one well-known experiment may gain someone a chair at a university or at least a promotion to a tenured position even if the result of that experiment turns out later to be wrong. Of course, in that case, the promotion is not reversed. But what about clarifying the material in a whole area, synthesizing it, distinguishing, at least in part, the true from the false, the reasonable from the unreasonable, offering the world a clear and reasonably accurate picture of what is understood and what is not? That is often not rewarded to anything like the same degree. Of course, we must have competing intermediaries. Otherwise, we would be returning to the imposition of authority, practice that was successfully challenged by European science, then called natural philosophy, in the 17th century. At that time, most European countries organized academies of sciences, for example, that of the Lincei in Italy. In England, the newly restored King Charles II established the Royal Society of London in 1660. Its motto was, and still is, nullius in verba, or to give it an English flavor, nullius in verba. <laughs> don't, trust, don't trust in anyone's words, means in anyone's words. Not in the words of Aristotle, for example, but in comparison of theory with observations of nature. It's bad enough that in many parts of the contemporary world, various breeds of political and religious fundamentalists, as well as old-fashioned tyrants, still impose their authority and suppress dissenting ideas. We who live in free societies must certainly not risk insulating from challenge some orthodoxy in science, scholarship, or the arts by relying on too few processors of information. In the scientific enterprise, fortunately, as you all know, false orthodoxies are eventually overthrown because science appeals over and over again to observations of nature. Eventually, we realize that poly water doesn't exist, that cold fusion is nonsense, that the prejudice against Einstein's theories of relativity was nothing but prejudice, and so on. Nevertheless, we're all familiar with examples of the persistence of prolonged resistance to correct ideas before they finally triumph. For example, I remember from personal experience how American geologists were almost all hostile to the idea of continental drift until the measurement of seafloor spreading and the accompanying explanation in terms of plate tectonics forced them, as late as the 1960s, to acknowledge that the continents had drifted after all 
We had some bitter arguments at Caltech in the 50s. The great physical anthropologist, Alesh Hrdlička of the Smithsonian, disbelieved in human occupation of the New World earlier than a couple of thousand years BC, imposed that view on the scientific community for many years until evidence such as that from the Folsom site in New Mexico compelled archeologists to move the date back at least to 10,000 years BC, and now uh, still earlier dates are being discussed as possibilities. Most historical linguists cling to the notion that family trees for languages cannot legitimately be extended to very large groupings for which the common ancestral tongue dates back earlier than six or 7,000 years ago because for such ancestral languages, the original sound system would be too hard to reconstruct. If they were right, the evidence for groupings that are, are acknowledged by them, such as Indo-European or Uralic, would be marginal, but it is not. The evidence for those groupings that they do acknowledge, going back something like 6,000 years, is overwhelming. So in my opinion, we have here another false orthodoxy, but one that still holds sway. In addition to the phenomenon of scientific ideas sometimes yielding slowly and reluctantly to new ones, we have the widespread phenomenon of misconceptions propagating through the media, including unfortunately, our computer media, simply through the tendencies of commentators to copy one another. Uh, for a trivial example, we may note how many news readers on US radio and television pronounce the J in the name of the Chinese capital in the French manner, even though the Mandarin Chinese sound that it represents is a good deal closer to the English pronunciation of J than to the French. Nevertheless, they keep saying Beijing over and over again for absolutely no reason except copying one another. They're just propagating a meme of error through ignorant imitation. Think how often people misuse the quotation from Hamlet, more honored in the breach than in the observance. Referring to drinking wassail, it meant that it was better not to follow the custom than to follow it, not to get blind drunk with a bunch of other people. But it has come to mean instead that a certain custom is mostly not followed. People say honored in the breach to mean that the custom isn't followed. Much more significant are scientific misconceptions that are widely propagated in the same manner. For instance, when a certain kind of subatomic particle, here I go back to my old profession, certain kind of subatomic particle disintegrates into two photons, Quantum mechanics tells us that whatever kind of polarization measurement is made on one of the photons, the result also conveys the corresponding information about the other photon. Somehow, though, the erroneous idea has got about that the measurement of the first photon instantaneously affects the other one in defiance of the theory of relativity, where, as you know, such an occurrence would imply that a cause could come after its effect, which is not too good. <laughs> of course, nothing of the kind occurs. This is simply a distortion of what really happens. Instead, a correlation between the two photons has been produced by their common origin in the disintegration that gave rise to them. What is special about quantum mechanics is that this entanglement of the states of the two photons is tighter than would have been possible classically, with the result that any polarization measurement of one of them yields the corresponding kind of information about both. But the common misconception that one photon, measurement of one photon instantaneously affects the other, spawns the notion that anything goes in quantum mechanics. Cause coming after the effect, instantaneous communication, precognition, psychokinesis, what have you. The US Department of Defense must be flooded with proposals to use this erroneous notion and its crackpot consequences for military purposes. In fact, I know that there are such proposals, I've seen them. I've been asked to waste my time commenting on them. It's clear that we have a greater need today than ever before for skilled intermediaries who can compete with one another to establish reputations for excellence. 
But supplying adequate compensation for their efforts presents a problem. Who is to decide which people are worthy processors of material that will in many cases be rather technical? That's why I've given some technical examples. The easiest approach, of course, is to leave the judgment to a marketplace, but the marketplace is composed largely of lay people in search of entertainment. And in that way, superficially attractive nonsense may frequently emerge triumphant. We can avoid this phenomenon, which, by the way, we witness every day on our television screens, only if we make better use of people who make a practice of thinking, knowing, understanding. Perhaps charitable foundations can play a leading role in helping to transform the system of rewards to favor skilled intermediaries who are intelligent, knowledgeable, and reasonable, as well as successful in appealing to large numbers of information consumers. But this whole issue needs to be studied in great depth and with attention to subtleties. As has been true for a long time in the established print media, niche markets appear. On the one hand, for nonsense like the weekly world news, remember the headline, cat swallows parrot, now it talks. <laughs> Kitty wants a cracker. Or, on the other hand, for somewhat more serious periodicals such as the New York Times. Unfortunately, as each of us perceives on reading about his or her own specialty, even the respected publications get, get a great many things wrong. Nevertheless, most of us exhibit an amazing gullibility as we tacitly assume that the rest of such a newspaper or magazine is fairly accurate. <laughs> One aspect that is obviously important, indeed of growing importance, is the need to communicate developments in science and scholarship to the public. A century ago, it was common for leading scientists like distinguished figures in the humanities to write understandably for the educated and interested public about their own work and that of their colleagues. Then, for several decades, such writing was much rarer. And the task of communicating was left largely to science journalists. Good as some of them are, it is heartening that nowadays they are joined by considerable numbers of scientists writing their own popular books. This point serves to illustrate that it is not only full-time intermediaries whose efforts will make a difference. In the long run, it is creative work in the sciences, the humanities, the arts, and the professions that will help the most to extract knowledge and understanding from the immense sea of data that threatens to drown humanity. The manner in which the digestion and interpretation of so-called information will be handled assumes particular importance as we enter the 21st century, the century in which human civilization must achieve a considerable measure of unity and sustainability if it is ever to do so. We are at a special time in history. Historians hate people who say that because it's been said so often before. But this time, there's a, there are two really good reasons, related reasons for saying so. We're at the time in history when the curve of total human population as a function of time is finally going through its inflection point. The rate of increase, in other words, has reached a maximum and is starting down. This is also the time when the human race can produce effects of order one on the biosphere, whether slowly by economic activity or rapidly by catastrophic war. As the human race gradually draws together to solve problems that are increasingly global in character, with the aid of rapid communication and dissemination of information worldwide, the associated complexities, contradictions, and difficulties loom large on the horizon. It is highly desirable for humanity to attain unity in diversity, as in our national motto, e pluribus unum, the need for a considerable measure of unity is obvious. However, just as it is crazy to destroy in a few decades a great deal of the biodiversity that has arisen over so many millions of years of biological evolution, so it is crazy to wipe out in a brief period much of the cultural diversity that has been built up over thousands of years of human cultural evolution. 
Nevertheless, there are contradictions involved. Some traditional cultures, as well as some circles in the most advanced societies, are resistant to the preservation of biological diversity. Some are reluctant to cooperate for the solution of other global problems. Worst of all, many are intolerant precisely of the universalizing, scientific, secular culture sympathetic to democracy and human rights that is a principal defender of cultural diversity worldwide. There's a paradox. How do we tolerate the intolerant? This kind of dilemma is characteristic of our era. Somehow, the human race has to find ways to respect and make use of the great variety of cultural traditions and still resist the threats of disunity, oppression, and obscurantism that some of those traditions present from time to time. The most serious danger is all too familiar. While encouraging the preservation of cultural diversity in the approaching era of the globalization of information, we must be careful not to promote developments that fuel the fires of ethnic hatred, which is in many cases just the other side of the cultural diversity coin. This tendency of human beings to divide themselves into groups that do not get along and sometimes come to blows may turn out to be in part an inherited tendency, left over from a time tens of thousands of years ago when such behavior might have been adaptive. Certainly it is not adaptive now in an age of highly destructive weapons. Similarly, the tendency of our species to wreak unnecessary havoc on the environment might also be an inherited relic of an earlier age when there were not many people and the ill effects of environmental abuse, while often very severe even then, were at least geographically restricted. But even if these tendencies are to some extent inherited, we know that they can be modified by culture. That is one of the saving features of humanity. In fact, while most human beings continue to distinguish sharply between us and them, for me, for example, them would include chemists. <laughs> People have made a great deal of progress over the ages in widening the conception of who we are. The largest unit of human society to which loyalty is owed has grown from the nuclear or extended family to a clan, a tribe, a city-state, a nation, even a region. A splendid example is afforded by the situation in Western Europe, where it is now almost inconceivable that a war could break out, such as the terrible one that ended uh, a little more than 50 years ago. We human beings seem to be moving, although gradually and with many disheartening setbacks, toward supplementing our local and national feelings with a planetary consciousness that embraces the whole of humanity and also, in some measure, the other organisms with which we humans share the biosphere. We may hope that many of the efforts to extract meaning from the mass of material circulating in the approaching global information society will reinforce this tendency. Besides the traditional divisions of humanity, we must deal as well with the multiplicity of groups with common interests, peculiar common beliefs, and even common delusions. We have seen how the internet has made it possible for members of such groups to find one another across geographic and social barriers. Crazy conspiracy theories, new superstitions, and urban folk tales flourish and spread as never before. Memes of error are thus propagated that are much more serious than mispronouncing the name of the Chinese capital or misinterpreting a quotation from Hamlet. We see then that the coming of the information age is reinforcing the simultaneous trends toward globalization and fragmentation that in any case characterize our era. But it is not only the fragmentation of humanity into separate cultural entities that creates opportunities problems and paradoxes for the information age. Just as it is important both to preserve cultural diversity and to supplement it with a universalizing planetary consciousness, so it is critical both to foster 
the various specialized fields of science and scholarship and to supplement them with integrative work that transcends disciplinary boundaries. Here, reference is made not just to subjects such as biochemistry or geophysics that bridge two neighboring fields, but to research that embraces a great many disciplines at a time. In order for intermediaries to extract really important knowledge and understanding from the vast amounts of material that will assail us in the future, they must be able to see some of the crucial connections among the different subjects involved. Not just the well-known connections, either. Intellectual effort must be harnessed to uncover large-scale patterns that are still mostly hidden. Emerging syntheses in science and scholarship that are not only important in their own right, but also helpful in making sense of all the data that are starting to deluge us. A number of us believe that some of the best opportunities to explore such emerging syntheses lie in mobilizing active cooperation among researchers in a wide variety of subjects. But that kind of cooperation is not so easy to attain at some of the best intellectual institutions. There are some good reasons why the great research universities and institutes of technology are organized along disciplinary lines with rather rigid boundaries between fields. Perhaps the most important reason is that our system of measuring excellence is tied to the disciplines. The whole apparatus of departments, degrees, journals, professional societies, sections of granting agencies is based on them. We know, too, how charlatans tend to cower in the crevices between subjects. Many of us are familiar, for example, with the kind of person whom the mathematicians believe to be a great physicist, and the physicists think is probably a great mathematician. At leading North American universities, interdisciplinary institutes do exist, but they are usually stepchildren, headed perhaps by a respected scholar who has earned a reputation in some conventional field, such an institute may be housed in a dilapidated Victorian frame house or in a shed built for temporary use during the First World War. <laughs> the younger researchers there have little influence on teaching policy and scant prospect for finding tenured positions. The responsibility for hiring professors and setting curricula is in the hands of the departments, tied to the disciplines. It's helpful, therefore, to supplement our universities with institutions where collaboration among specialists in a great variety of subjects is more the rule than the exception. One such place is the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico, which I helped to found and where I now work, after spending 40 years at excellent but somewhat more conventional places, such as the University of Chicago and the California Institute of Technology. At SFI, we are not trying to compete with these great teaching and research institutions. In fact, in the course of our work, we hope to help them in two different but related ways. One is to encourage them, them to move in their deliberate way toward facilitating close collaboration in research among faculty members and graduate students and others from many different departments. The other is to provide a place where some of their brightest people who yearn for such collaboration can engage in it right now. Most of the research at SFI is connected with one important general area in which numerous disciplines come together. That is the area that I call plectics. Plectics is the study of simplicity and complexity and of complex adaptive systems, those that learn or adapt or evolve the way living things on Earth evolve. Complex adaptive systems on this planet include the process of biological evolution, the behavior of individual living organisms, the functioning of certain parts of organisms, such as the human brain or the mammalian immune system. Another complex adaptive system is the whole human scientific enterprise. Today, also, there exist artificial, computer-based complex adaptive systems such as neural nets and genetic algorithms. In addition, it should be noted here that the internet has many of the features of a composite complex adaptive system. 
A significant fraction of the work being done on the similarities and differences among complex adaptive systems is carried out by members of the far-flung SFI family. The specialties represented include mathematics, computer science, physics, chemistry, immunology, population biology, ecology, evolutionary biology, neurobiology, psychology, cultural anthropology, archaeology, linguistics, history, and economics. SFI holds seminars and issues research reports on topics such as the spread of the AIDS epidemic, the waves of large-scale abandonment of prehistoric pueblos in what is now the southwestern U.S., the foraging strategies of ant colonies, how money can be made by utilizing the non-random aspects of price fluctuations in financial markets. Two of our people quit to do that. <laughs> formed a quite successful firm. What happens to ecological communities when an important species is removed? How to program computers to evolve new strategies for playing games? And how quantum mechanics leads to the familiar quasi-classical world we see around us. Those who study complex adaptive systems are beginning to find some useful general principles that seem to characterize all such systems. Some of the important contributions are being made by the handful of scholars and scientists who are transforming themselves from specialists into students of simplicity and complexity or of complex adaptive systems in general. In other words, students of plectics. Success in making that transition from specialist to student of a general subject. Success is often associated with a certain style of thought. The philosopher von Schelling introduced the distinction between Apollonians, who favor logic, the analytical approach, and a dispassionate weighing of evidence, and Dionysians, who lean more toward intuition, synthesis, and passion. These traits are sometimes described as correlating very loosely with emphasis on the use of the left and the right brain, respectively. But some of us seem to belong to a third category, the Odysseans, who combine the two predilections in their quest for connections among ideas. Such people often feel lonely in conventional institutions, but they find at SFI a particularly congenial environment. And they help to overcome the idea so prevalent in both academic and bureaucratic circles that the only work worth taking seriously is highly detailed research in a specialty, while more general discussions are relegated to cocktail party conversation. While freely acknowledging the continuing centrality of specialized investigations, one should celebrate the equally vital contribution of those who dare to take what I call a crude look at the whole. That's W-H-O-L-E. A complex nonlinear system adaptive or non-adaptive, can usually not be adequately described by dividing it up into subsystems or various aspects defined beforehand. If those subsystems or those aspects, all in strong interaction with one another, are studied separately, even with great care, the results when put together do not give a useful picture of the whole. In that sense, there is profound truth in the old adage the whole is more than the sum of its parts. But of course the parts or the separate aspects are much easier to analyze or model thoroughly in detail, while the theoretical look at the whole must necessarily be comparatively crude. Yet we must swallow our pride and take that crude look. We human beings are now confronted with immensely complex ecological and social problems, and we are in urgent need of better ways of dealing with them. When we attempt to tackle such difficult problems, we naturally tend to break them up into more manageable pieces. That is a useful practice, but it has serious limitations. Now, the chief of an organization, say a head of government or a CEO, has to behave as if he or she is taking into account all the aspects of a situation, including the interactions among them, which are often strong. It's not so easy, however, 
for the chief to take a crude look at the whole if everyone else in the organization is concerned only with a partial view. Even if some people are assigned to look at the big picture, it doesn't always work out. A few months ago, the CEO of a gigantic uh, conglomerate corporation told me that he had a strategic planning staff to help him think about the future of the business. But that the members of that strategic planning staff suffered from three defects. They seemed largely disconnected from the rest of the company. Two, no one could understand what they said. Three, everyone else seemed to hate them. <laughs> Despite such experiences, it is vitally important that we supplement our specialized studies with serious attempts to take a crude look at the whole. In connection with the problems faced by the human race and the rest of the biosphere, some of the best studies will, in my opinion, involve ingenious mixtures of scenario writing and computer modeling and simulation. Since much of the research at SFI is carried out by computer modeling and simulation, we are becoming familiar with some of the problems associated with that kind of work. The advantage, of course, is obvious. Computer studies permit the researcher to get a handle on the behavior of models that are much too complicated to study analytically. Even if the models and simulations are highly oversimplified, they may share certain mathematical features with phenomena in the real world. And those features can then be better understood because we have examples from the simple computer model. The most important caveat for any simple model of a complex system is not to take it too seriously. If conclusions from studying the model are to be applied to policy issues, the warning must be even sterner. You may cause great harm if you take it too seriously. On many occasions, as everyone knows, very evil consequences have ensued from the application of oversimplified scientific or even worse, pseudoscientific models to matters of policy. One of our visitors suggested wisely that models be used as prostheses for the imagination. In that role, they can be extremely valuable. A striking feature of computer modeling is the trade-off between detail and transparency. If a model is so general that it can be applied crudely to a wide class of systems, such as probably exist on many planets scattered through the universe, then it may be simple enough so that the results of a series of runs can be rather easily interpreted. If, however, a few special features of our own planet are built in, chosen from such subjects as terrestrial biology, the nature of human beings, or specific human history and human social organization, then the results of running the model will be far harder to interpret, although they may well be more relevant to some real scientific or policy problem. A way to improve the transparency of a model is to set it up so that many of the assumptions and parameters can be altered at will. Many people can then play with those features in different ways. If conclusions survive that kind of treatment, they are likely to be fairly robust. One intriguing characteristic of all this work is that the tools of the information age are being used in the search for intellectual syntheses that may help mankind to cope with some of the problems posed by the onset of that very age. Let me close with a remarkably relevant quotation from a sonnet by Edna St. Vincent Millay, supplied by a source that some of you may find surprising President Clinton's science advisor. The poem is from the book Huntsman What Quarry. Upon this gifted age, in its dark hour, falls from the sky a meteoric shower of facts. They lie unquestioned, uncombined. Wisdom enough to leech us of our ill is daily spun but there exists no loom to weave it into fabric. Thank you. <laughs>